So, good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the fifth Kuwait Neurology Conference. My name is Dr. Jasim al Hashil. I'm the president of Kuwait Neurological Society and the chair of this conference. It gives me a great pleasure to have all of you uh, attending this event virtually due to this pandemic. Over the past 10 years, we have been conducting this Kuwait Neurology Conference with international speakers. But due to the pandemic, we came with many challenges to uh, uh, do this event with our esteemed speakers from Kuwait. And hopefully everyone will be enjoying these two days of brief coverage of different neurological disorders. This is a CME accredited event. And also I would like to uh, thank all the organizing committee and our speakers to put their time to do these presentations during this challenging time and to attend also physically. This is first of its kind in Kuwait to do a hybrid meeting, including physical attendance of the speakers and also online at the same time. I do understand uh, the technology glitches and some difficulties. So I do also appreciate your patience with us in case you face any technology uh, delay. This presentation will be on demand as well in two weeks after the events. So without further ado, I will start the meeting and the first uh, session is the headache sessions and my presentation is uh, the first one. Uh, I'm a consultant in neurologist. Uh, I'm a headache specialist. Uh, I work at Ibn Sina Hospital and I'm associate professor at the Kuwait University. So, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia and includes four types of headache. The first one is a cluster headache and also paroxysmal hemicrania, sentence tuna and hemicrania continua. We'll start first with cluster headache. The lifetime cluster headache is around 124 per 100,000. This is as much as multiple sclerosis in the UK. We know that the prevalence of this is mainly affecting male and they are usually smoker. So we do see female as well. The prevalence has been said also, it's equally probably affected in male and female in the Western country due to the smoking that is probably uh, common among even females. Episodic cluster is way common than a chronic cluster headache. And it's about six to one. To define episodic cluster headache, you have to have two episodes of a cluster lasting from one week up to one year. And there should be a separation of three months. You have to know that this has been done in the latest classification of the headache disorder third edition. Previously, we thought it's one month, but one month is not an enough time to separate between the, between the episodic and chronic cluster headache. So remember the rule of three months separation without a treatment. If there is a three months off without a treatment, then this is actually either you define it as episodic or cluster. It's not one month anymore. The autonomic feature you will see, the commonest autonomic feature is lacrimation. We do see autonomic features in migraine patients in about 30 to 40% as well. Now, photophobia also can be seen in the patients with cluster headache. So in about 50% of patients with cluster headache, we do see also their uh, photophobia. Interestingly, the photophobia in a patient with a cluster headache is usually unilateral. This is unlike what we see in a migraine patient where it is 
bilateral. So the commonest manifestation is lacrimation, conjunctival injection, and, they, and then the nasal symptom, which could be either congestions or runny nose. This is an interesting article published this year, and it has been done based on an internet survey and, uh, in the US, and they found it has been conducted over 1,000 of people with a cluster headache. And in more than 1,000 of people, of patients who has cluster headache, when they were asked about their pain experience, they rated the cluster headache as this one of the worst. And even in a female, they asked, they say that this is even worse than the labor pain. So in a numerical scale, it came as 9.7. This is just to give you an idea when a patient with a cluster headache come to you to the other clinic and they cry with the tears and congestion in the nose or they throw themselves. So this is a true, they are really in severe pain. The cranial autonomic symptoms we are referring to in these patients with autonomic or trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia and includes conjunctival injection, tearing, con nasal congestion, congestion or runny nose, eyelid edema. They can have facial swelling or sweating. One of the symptoms that we do recognize also is the fullness in the ear. So fullness in the ears, this is again something you will see and many of the cluster patients, they will tell you that we feel fullness in their ear. The ptosis and the meiosis also sometimes can't be seen. You can ask your patients. Some of your patients will actually picture themselves to see their ptosis. Cluster headache, based on the International Classification of Headache Disorder, the latest edition, which is the third edition, should have more than five attacks. Nice. Classical teaching, and this is a very important note that you have to know that the shorter is the name, is the longer the attack. So cluster headache is the shorter, the shortest name, but it does have the longest attack. So the attack is between 15 to 180 minutes. Now, short sun headache, which is short lasting unilateral neurology form headache with conjunctival injection and tearing, although it's the longest name, but it has the shortest attack between one to 600 seconds. So the headache should have one of the following symptoms. It's either the C and uh, one or two or one of them. So as I say, the autonomic features, plus one of the very important features of cluster headache that they will have restlessness, pacing. We say that they cannot stay still. This is unlike migraine patient where they prefer to stay in a quiet room and they, do, I, they hate to move because one of the features also of migraine that actually the pain can't be ex exacerbated with movement. They can have the frequency either one every other day to eight attacks per day. And as, as I say, to differentiate between episodic and the chronic, it should be three months in between without the treatment. There is a phenomena which is involved in patients with uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia, which is the periodicity. Periodicity, we refer to circadian or circannual. The circannual, that means the clustering of the, of the attacks during specific months. And that's what we see. Most of the patients actually, they do cluster during the October, November, and January. And that's what we see also, what we have been seeing in Kuwait as well. We published this in 2019, that majority of our patients come during October. The circadian is actually, again, due to the hypothalamus, it's actually the most of the attacks happen during 2 or 3 a.m. And that's what your patient will tell you about this. Now, that's what we have published in Frontier in Neurology in our study that we conducted between 2016 and 2018. Over 46 patients, the three of them were female only. Interestingly, the three of them were smokers. One of the interesting phenomena as well, when people try to quit smoking, actually cluster headache become less frequent in these patients. So... The majority, again, and 50% of these patients, they do have one cluster or one episode per year. Some of them, they do have more than attack per year, and some of them, they will have an attack every two or three years. The majority, or 100% of them, they did have rhinorrhea and nasal congestion, and 97%, they did have lacrimation. So what shall we do with those patients? The first thing, actually, I do tell my President and even my colleagues, it's actually to review the diagnosis because these patients can be misdiagnosed as migraine, but in reality, 
is actually they are cluster or they, some people, they can diagnose them with a cluster, but in fact, they are migraine. So review their diagnosis. Female gender should not stop you from diagnosing these patients that they have a cluster headache. Even if they don't, we start to see even non-smoker patients actually they do have cluster headache. The level A evidence for these patients is for sub-Q immigrant or sumatriptan. You can give up to two injections. Each injection is six milligram. You can give nasal spray of sumatriptan, 20 milligram. Zolmetriptan or Zomig, you can give these patients actually. But remember, the majority of the country, they have 2.5. So they can up, they go up to two tablets of Zolmetriptan or Zomig. Well, I don't have actually here uh, the, the, the nasal spray of DHE, which is another thing that you can give those patients. 100% of oxygen, that's the quickest thing, and you can have it available in the polyclinic. So I usually provide my patient with a piece of paper. So they should go to high flow with a facial mask. It's not a nasal prong, and it should run from 12 to 15 minutes. Remember that these patients usually that they are smokers. So when you provide them with a cylinder of oxygen, you have to warn them that with the smoking that, 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 can key, uh, that can cause actually fire and uh, that's something very serious can happen. So you have to warn your patient about smoking with a cylinder gas around. Now, the other thing, the level two evidence is actually inter intranasal lidocaine. I don't use a lot of this, but there is a lot of people that are using as phenocath lidocaine. There is no great evidence about intranasal lidocaine. With the drawback of this is actually many people of cluster headache, they do have nasal congestion. And when they do have a nasal congestion, actually you will decrease the absorption from the nasal mucosa for the intranasal lidocaine. Some of the people, they say you can put the intranasal lidocaine in the epstilateral side of the cluster headache, but we found that this is not typically correlated actually where you find this in the, in the brain or, or in the hypothalamus. Now, DHE or dihydroargatamine, we have it available as an ampoule. This is one milligram. So you can give this as an IV actually or as an Level two evidence also for non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator, but the evidence is only for episodic cluster. It's not significant for chronic cluster patients. So what limitation we do have with the management? The triptans you cannot use more than two times. Some of the patients, they have more than two attacks. So what shall we do? The other thing, we cannot combine DHE with the triptans because of the vasoconstriction. It's not always in 100% patients actually, they will have, they will respond to the uh, oxygen. It's only 70 to 80% of the patient, they do respond to the oxygen. So what shall we do with the other patients? And you have to remember also that these patients actually in their 50s and 60s, so they may have ischemic heart disease or uncontrolled hypertension. So using these DHE compounds or triptans put you at risk of the patient actually vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction in these uh, patients. What shall we do for prevention? So you can use a prevention for even episodic cluster when they are frequent, or if the patient will have one attack per year, you can use just a short course and you wait and see. Uh, but if they have more than a frequent attacks, so you can start them in a prevention. For short term or transitional or bridging therapy, you can do greater occipital nerve injection. I do many of the greater occipital nerve injection. So what we use, we use dipomidrol, 40 milligram or 80 milligram, and we mix this with lidocaine, about two to three cc. Uh, the group in Paris, Leroux group, with published in Lancet Neurology in 2011, they mentioned actually that repeated injection of Greater occipital nerve actually was beneficial, and you can do these repeated injection over 48 to 72 hours with no harm, with no harm in a patient with episodic or chronic cluster headache, despite they have been on verapamil. You can use a short actually course of prednisolone over 16 or 18 or 20 days, 21 days, and you just go tapering dose. I usually go to 80 milligram unless the patient weight is below 60 milligram. You can use DHE one milligram every eight hours and you can go for a few days with this. Now the long term, the best evidence for long term is for verapamil. And you have to know that verapamil is a calcium channel blocker. So each patient you're gonna start verapamil, you have to do a baseline ECG. 
The best evidence for verapamil is for short lasting, actually, for the immediate release verapamil, not for the sustained release. The majority of the people, they do use sustained release, but the, because of the erratic absorption for sustained release, we don't, we don't know exactly what is the lifetime or the, the biomedical availability of this uh, 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 sustained release verapamil. So it's better to go with 80 milligram TDS to start, and then you can titrate the dose. Uh, every two weeks, and you have to repeat your ECG. The one of the thing actually interesting with verapamil, you may find it's not a dose dependent arrhythmia. So you may find arrhythmia even with a low dose, and you may don't find arrhythmia at the beginning of the starting the dose, but later in the disease you may find an arrhythmia people with verapamil. So ECG is very important. You have to always check their pulses. Other thing is non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation and the evidence based on the ACT-1 and ACT-2 trial is significant only for episodic cluster, not for chronic cluster headache. The other thing for prevention is melatonin, to pyramid. There is some evidence for botulinum toxin injection. And as I said, also for uh, non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation, with invasion is actually you can use phenopalatine ganglion stimulation. Unfortunately, although the evidence is good and is significant, but the patient, but the company went bankruptcy actually in the last two years. So that's very unfortunate for this company. I don't know in the, in the coming year with this pandemic, what will happen with the sphenopalatine ganglion. I believe that the sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation is way better than sphenocat actually lidocaine injection because that will give only a temporary actually improvement in the patient with a cluster headache. So Greater occipital nerve block, you just identify the posterior occipital protuberance or the anion and your mastoid process. You go midway over this. Sometimes I do block the third occipital nerve. The usually in the middle is the greater occipital. And if you go actually uh, more later, you may even block the greater auricular nerve. You have to look for the occipital artery. So you have to be always worried. Uh, about occipital artery, just do some aspiration and make sure you are not in a vessel. One of the complications is the alopecia. I have never experienced actual alopecia in my patient, but actually the local discomfort is common. Some of the literature actually said even if the patient has tenderness or if the patient has uh, if the patient has tenderness or they have uh, discomfort with the, with, the, with the injection, that may indicate actual improvement. So I just tell them, wait, that's probably a good sign that the headache will disappear. Okay, so I, I spoke about constipation with the verapamil and actually the arrhythmia. So the total number of the arrhythmia actually uh, based on Cohen group is actually around 20%. The total no, uh, the number of arrhythmia, first degree block is the commonest one. Now, this is a, a non-invasive vagal stimulator. This is the old version. This is the newer version of the gamma core for non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator. As I say, this is evidence for only episodic, not chronic cluster patient. You can use it as a prevention or during even the acute attack. And it has been actually shown superiority, significant superiority actually to the sham procedures. This is the sphenopalatine ganglion stimulation. You insert the stimulator and you can actually, uh, there is a monitor for this and you can program it, but unfortunately, the, the, the company went to actually panicropsy, so I will not go further into this. The emerging therapy, which is an excellent therapy, that's what stopped us actually, if you remember 10 years ago, people, they were talking about deep brain stimulation, posterior hypothalamus deep brain stimulation, but we think this is invasive of procedures and with the availability of the treatment now, especially with galcanizumab now, is actually you can stop the patient. Uh, from their, from having severe attacks. The evidence for galcanizumab or migality is a 300 milligram. And it comes actually in the three pre-filled syringes. Each syringe is 100 milligram. You, can, you will inject each injection separately in a different site. So there is an evidence came and the FDA approved this actually for a patient with, again, episodic cluster headache, not a chronic cluster headache. I don't know. There is probably something specific about chronic cluster headache. It could be the CGRB level in these patients, or it could be there is another neurotransmitter actually playing in this patient. That's why probably non-invasive vagal nerve stimulator and the 
uh, galcanizumab only working in a patient with episodic notic chronic cluster headache. I'll switch gears now to proxismal hemicrania, which is much less common. Remember that the commonest one from the tax or trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia is a cluster headache. The proxismal hemicrania is a probably a equally affecting male and female. And the chronic paroxysmal hemicrania is more common than the episodic hem paroxysmal hemicrania. So they should have 20 attacks. It's two to 30 minutes, actually. They have autonomic features, but there is a specific thing actually about paroxysmal he hemicrania, and it's the pain is absolutely actually prevented by endomethacin. So usually we start the patient with 25 milligram three times a day. You can bump the dose. The maximum dose is 225 milligram. In the literature, there are some people actually went above 225, but we don't really advise this because of the gastric complaint. Now, some of the centers, they do have endomethacin available as an IV preparation, and you can go over 100 to 200 milligram, and you can try this actually as an inpatient and some of the patients, then you can switch them. You just want to improve that this headache actually, to prove that this headache is responsive to endomethacin. The chronic, the chronic type of paroxysmal hemicrania, as I said, is, uh, is more common and it's actually, uh, it's, uh, it's more in a female. Remember the rule of three months is actually, that's how you define between episodic and chronic is you have three months without any attacks. So that's chronic paroxysmal hemicrania, that's a chronic cluster. So the rule of three months again. Now, some tends to, now that's a very rare headache. Short-lasting unilateral neurology form headache with conjunctival injection and tearing or short-lasting unilateral neurology form headache with autonomic manifestation. They do have, the main thing is actually in sooner only one or neither are two, neither of conjunctival injection or lacrimation, but the headache, they look the same. The headache is very bad, is actually it's moderate to severe, and usually those are side look. One of the important information, we think that cluster is actually is only strictly unilateral, but there is actually many case reports about patients with the cluster that they switch places. Same things actually, I hate, or many people actually they had that they see the migraine only on one side and they don't switch. But in the literature, again, there has been migraine, which is strictly unilateral in such patients. The instant actually will have the duration, remember in the second edition, it was five to 240 seconds. This has been changed actually to one second to 600 sec seconds. So they can have a group of stabs actually in a total duration of 10 to 1,200 seconds and they can go with like a, a so tooth pattern actually. They have multiple uh, attacks or stabs actually of pain. This pain is actually not triggerable, uh, sorry, it's a triggerable. This is unlike trigeminal neuralgia. So in a trigeminal neuralgia, you will have a refractory period. So the main differential actually between SUNT is actually the trigeminal neuralgia. Two of the two uh, features actually can help you to differentiate the two. The, the refractory period, which you will have in trigeminal neuralgia, where people, they don't have pain. And during this time, they can shave, they can eat, they can brush their teeth. But actually in sun, this is actually in 80% is triggerable, which usually with a cutaneous uh, touching or stimulation. In sun, also you have to do, actually in all tax trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia, you have to do MRI brain looking specifically for the suprasellar region. 10% of the patient with tax, they do have actually suprasellar lesion and usually it's a pro prolactinoma. Usually the reason is actually because the supracellular region is touching the hypothalamus. And this is where we say it's the periodicity because of the, something happening at the level of the hypothalamus which gives you the periodicity. Is it due to the prolactin itself? We are not sure. One of the best treatment and the first treatment you should try with a patient with sun is actually lam lamotrigine. So lamotrigine actually, I have three or four patients actually, some two of them male and the other two is actually female and you all of them actually responded nicely to lamictal or lamotrigine. Hemicrania continua, this is the last one. It's a continuous headache. It's a continuous headache, moderate to severe, side lock with uh, more than three months. It has to be more than actually, it has to be continuous more than three months. It has the autonomic features. And that's another headache actually, which is completely prevented by endomethacin. So it's usually it's prevented. The other way of managing this patient is actually also 
other COX-2 inhibitor, sorry, other non-steroidal, you can use COX-2 also inhibitors in these patients, but many of these patients actually, they respond to greater layer block. So many of them actually, they don't need to be in endomethacin, actual, but they need to be on repeated injection of greater occipital uh, nerve block. One of the criteria which will be introduced maybe to the new classification which come or the when there will be an addition to the international classification of addictive disorder, they classify this and uh, chronic hemicrania continue as remitting or unremitting. So the remitting type, if you have 24 hours without any pain or unremitting type, if you don't have any 24 hours, if you have 24 hours with no pain, we will call this remitting type of hemicrania continue. But you have to know that hemicrania continue always run on a certain level of pain, then they will have pain, but they always, they don't go to the zero level. This is my last slide. So I just put this to wrap up this presentation to differentiate between the most important three types of trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia, the cluster, the paroxysmal hemicrania, and the sunt and the suna. You have to know that in cluster mainly it's male, but you can see this in a female, and you have to know the number of the attacks, and the duration, as we say, the longer is the name, the shorter is the longer is the name, the shorter is the attack, as you see in Sant and Suna. And actually, you have to know the autonomic feature, which are very prominent in patients with Sant and Suna, and the migrainous feature, you can have this. Even migrainous features and photophobia, you can see it in, in a patient with hemicrania continua. Alcohol is well-known trigger to the patient with cluster headache. But we know that the alcohol trigger the people during that attack. So it's when they are not during that attack, usually alcohol is not triggering their attack of cluster. But during that attack, it's actually the people that can trigger their migraine. This is based on many actually publications. The cutaneous trigger is, is really a feature of patient with Sunt and Suna, but not uh, features of other uh, patients with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, it's not a feature of, of the other trigeminotomic cephalology. I just came to remember that the two things actually differentiate between Sunt and Suna, uh, between Sunt and uh, trigeminal neuralgia is actually the first one is the uh, refractory period, which will you find at trigeminal neuralgia and also response to carbamazepin. So Tigretol, usually patient with trigeminal neuralgia, not patient with, uh, with uh, Sunt. These are the two features. So that's the end of my presentation.